so, so that being said, when you're doing CMD testing um, and you in your brain have a cut and dry diagnosis, does that mean it's done and you're finished with it? Or do you still have to be the physician and treat the patient, not just the numbers? So always have to treat the patient. Um, and, and, and that's why we are concentrating today um, or in these in these episodes on coronary microvascular dysfunction in one endotype, which we're talking about CFR, IMR, RRR, uh, R, R, uh, uh, RFR, and FFR. We're just combining it into core flow system. But the full picture has to come from a comprehensive coronary flow or coronary physiology testing, where you have to understand the impact of vasospasticity, um, epicardial vasospastic angina, um, microvascular vasospastic angina, and the effect of estalconi challenges on all, all, the, all the coronary circulation. You cannot just take better pieces and, and go, go, go with your diagnosis. However, we also know that there is clinical scenarios. And most of the time, is it really necessary to do a start calling on every single patient? Not necessarily true, because many patients, you know that going in, you will have microvascular dysfunction, high CMD, and then you'll make a diagnosis and you go home. Um, those patients that are really sent to you because there is a dilemma in understanding, there's a mystery in knowing what they have, then I do recommend having a full picture to collect all data you have to make a good decision for a patient. But I never treated numbers. I don't, I, I mentioned this early on, a, a borderline CFR or a borderline IMR is not going to make or break the case. At the end of the day, there's a patient that's been struggling, for example, multiple angiograms, multiple stress tests. If their IMR is 25 sharp, guess what? That's high because clinically they they meet the 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 clinical diagnosis. It doesn't, my my value, it doesn't mean much into it. Now we did, we did the procedure, everything is safe, and it's time for you to explain what you found and the measurements. The question now, I obtained now a very accurate, and I believe all I did was totally correct and following CAT-CMD. What do I need to know? What values I look for? Pretest probability is important. So why the patient is on the table is very important and how I look at things. If I'm looking at a myocardial bridge, for example, then the first two values I need to look for is RFR and FFR. I want to make sure that there is no epicardial gradient that was created by that myocardial bridge. If I'm looking at nothing and it's clean, first, my RFR was already done. I pay attention to while I'm doing the procedure because it's the first value I did. So if the RFR is abnormal, then I would stop and then question myself. How come the RFR is not normal? Normal, I move on. Second I would look for is CFR. Uh, and the CFR value, um, what historically we used, is a 2.0, but because we know that thermodilution could overestimate um, coronary flow, we accept value now of 2.5. Now, again, ask yourself a question, and you will face that in clinical practice. So if, so if, if I do a, a, a patient that has a CFR of 2.6, uh, is that uh, excluding CMD? Now, this will take me to second layer, which is let's look at the IMR. If the IMR is 52, which is above 25, the cutoff we're using, and a CFR of 2.6, I would call this microvascular dysfunction. I understand it's 2.6. I know it's not the cutoff that um, we're teaching or we, we put in CAT-CMD. But remember, there's a patient story, there's a clinical story, and there are more specific values such as IMR that's indicating that I have a problem. I will look at IMR. I will take that precedence over CFR. So CFR, I would take it as the most fluid, most acceptable gray zone as opposed to IMR. But an IMR of 16, you're out. That's a very normal IMR. If an IMR of 26, I consider that abnormal because 25 is the cutoff that we decided to use. So IMR is more specific. CFR, I accept more gray, gray zone. To confirm my reading, 
or to confirm my diagnosis or having more support, I want you to think about it as if you are presenting a case in a, in a court of law. What are you trying to do is you want to bring more evidence to support the case while the patient is on the table. So now, if I have some equivocal CFR, borderline ish IMR, I will look at RRR because RRR, the way I understand it, is, a, is the CFR of resistance, which means it's the resistance over the entire cycle. It's not IMR. IMR is the lowest PD multiplied by your transient time as a surrogate for flow. So the lowest PD, a snap shot of, the, uh, of PD. When you do RRR, it's your entire PD changes and resistance th throughout the whole cycle, almost like a CFR. So RRR is the CFR of resistance. That does not mean that the values are similar to CFR. There should be a discrepancy between RRR and CFR, and you would see some discrepancy. W the value that we believe it's abnormal for RRR is anything less than 3.5. So 3.5 is the cutoff. Uh, have we established this in guidelines or in best practices? No, we haven't. But it's the idea that if RRR is low and your CFR is borderline-ish, then RRR should take precedence as supportive to IMR and these patients have microvascular dysfunction. So RRR is the resistance over the cycle, IMR, CFR, that's how I take them in, uh, in, a, in ranking uh, if I want to look at my data. And obviously at the end, you're going to look at FFR, um, and FFR is, is normal, um, which it should. If your RFR is already normal, then you're done with the procedure. So far, we talked about the values in core flow on the left side of the column or, or the values. So when you have a CFR value, next to it, there is CFR normalized. And if you look down, there's IMR, and there is IMR corrected. Um, what prompts me to look at these values, or why these values are there? Are there a reason, is there a reason for them? They are there for a reason. And the reason is, if you have an abnormal FFR, um, and um, you want to know what your, micro, what your IMR is, what your CFR is, assuming that there is no epicardial disease, which means your PD over PA is 1 and your FFR is 1, the machine or the software already giving you that assumption. So if I'm looking at a, at a case, um, and as we know, CFR could be changed because of epicardial disease, but not every epicardial disease need to, need to be fixed. But let's say my FFR was 0.87. It's above the cutoff of 0.8 for meter per stent, but most certainly it could affect your CFR because now you have, you have a 60% a, um, narrowing, um, and that narrowing means they have atherosclerosis in the epicardial arteries, and you could also have a mixed pattern where you have microvascular disease also. Um, so what is my IMR if my FFR is 0.87? That's when I shift my attention to IMR corrected, assuming that if this same patient had no LED 60% narrowing and their FFR was completely normal at one, what would be my IMR? That's when I pay attention to CFR norm and then IMR corrected, and that's what I use it for. What kind of things, when you get your results, trigger you to go, ah, wait a minute, something's not right? Okay, so most of the time, the, the most um, important clinical scenario that always throw me off is myocardial bridge. Because when we do angiogram, some, some of the myocardial bridges, they are not that pronounced without hyperemia, without nitroglycerin. When you give these um, 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 medications, you kind of make the, if you give nitroglycerin, then you will vasodilate proximal to the bridge, vasodilate distal to the bridge, you'll have more pronounced and geographic looking uh, myocardial bridge. With adenosine, you could have the exact same value because you are, you have, you're increasing your flow, you could have more pronounced myocardial bridge. These cases are the most troublesome to me because I'm doing it, I didn't see with my diagnostic angiogram the, the myocardial bridge. I don't tend to keep injecting because once you normalized, you flushed, you gave nitroglycerin, you equalized, and you're down the, the, the wire down the LED, it's, not, it's preferred not to do injections. Why are we going to do injection? You're already in, you know where you're going. So because I don't see what happens to the coronary artery, um, uh, once I put the wire down with nitro or with adenosine, some of these values get me out of whack because I'm like, 
how come this is possible? And you take an angiogram and you see a very pronounced myocardial bridge that could affect your measurements, especially RFR. 